Father, we thank you so much for your love, Lord, and we just uh, thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, I just uh, thank you so much for your word. Lord, the, the Spirit of God is, is in it, and Lord, we just thank you so much for that. And Lord, as we uh, read your word, Father, Lord, just help us all to understand what it says. Lord, I thank you for Brother Mike, and Lord, as he comes today, we just lift him before you. Lord, just ask that uh, you just teach through him, Father. And Lord, I thank you for Waylon and uh, these people behind me as they uh, bring the song, Lord, that we need to hear. And Lord, just help us all to prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope all of y'all read those words as we went through. We live in the greatest nation on earth. A lot goes into what, a lot has been put into keeping this nation this way. And that's why we celebrate this time of year, our independence. We need to continue to pray for the independence of America and for America to turn back to God where it all started. But that's our job. We're all called to do that. If nothing else, that was preaching, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Tomorrow night we will not be meeting. Uh, it's a holiday. The office will be closed Monday and Tuesday to celebrate. Uh, the other announcements, you can read all those. Uh, the men's conference, Brother Steve Hale will be coming to do that for us. <clears throat> he come through earlier, a couple of years ago. He's a real intelligent guy. He's written several books. He's going to be teach, have a men's conference on Friday night and Saturday. So y'all plan to attend that men. So it's going to be really good to it. I want to make mention of this tear-off we have on our bulletin. Would you please fill that out and turn it in or put it in the offering box or give it to the preacher on your way out where we'll have a record of your attendance here. Any other announcements? All right, Brother Wade, go ahead. Thank you. Stand with us. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mind.
have a seat. <laughs> you smell that? Chlorine? No, that is freedom, my friend. It smells like there's too much chlorine in there to me. No, my friend, that is the sweet smell of freedom. Daddy, my eyes are burning again. I told you not to open them under the water, sweetheart. But I'm wearing my goggles. Off you go. <sighs> what were we talking about? Chlorine? No, freedom. Yes, the sweet smell of freedom. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't smell it somewhere. The freedom that I have of choosing ribeye over sirloin. Freedom that I have to watch my son play his baseball games, knowing that he has the freedom of making anything out of himself that he wants. With lots and lots of practice. The freedom that I have of choosing charcoal over gas. I smell freedom. I smell an explosion. What was that? Smell dinner. Ha <laughs> ha! God bless America! He already has. Indeed he has. A lot. A lot. You know what? It's worse. America's better off than the vast majority of countries in the world. Yeah, I mean, think about it. God has blessed America with countless uh, numbers of men and women who were willing to give their lives so that we can live in a country that is run by its citizens rather than a dictator, right? And not only that, but think about this. I have the God-given freedom to speak my mind and not have to worry about being imprisoned. Think about this. We live in a country that like, no matter your age, your race, your gender, your religious preference, we were all created equal. Created, right, means there has to be a creator, and that creator is God. And not only that, I have the freedom on any given Sunday, for that matter, any day of the week, to worship God wherever I want, however I want. Why do I have that freedom? Because of God. You know what, I stopped listening about a quarter of the way through, but you had me at God Bless America. Yeah, I didn't say that, you did. <laughs> I did say that, you're right. Oh, I also said this. W-W-A-L-D? What would Abe Lincoln do? Think about that, my friend. What would Abe Lincoln do? Probably use less lighter fluid.
All right, they ain't waiting for me to dismiss them, are they? That's good. All right, as they head out for Children's Church, and I want to ask you a question this morning. When we sang those patriotic hymns and songs right there at the end, did you feel like you were worshiping America? Huh? That's what all the skinny jeans tell us these days. That we shouldn't even have a flag in our auditorium. It's a sacrilegious to have a flag in here. And that we need to get anything about America out of here. Well, and it's not about, it's not about worshiping America, but it is about being thankful for the freedoms we have as a nation, being thankful for what God has done here, being thankful for those who fought and died for our freedoms. And, uh, and, but, but we do have a difference in ideology in a lot today, but it is not wrong. I believe that we come here to worship God this morning. We didn't come here to worship America. We came here to be honest about America today, and we love America, and we're thankful for America. I, I thank God often that, that I was born in America and not in some country that didn't have the freedom, doesn't have the freedoms that we have here. And uh, I, I'm thankful for that. But I've come here today to worship the Lord. But at the same time, just like I love America, I, I love you, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I love America, and we need to face the truth about America too, don't we? we got some areas that we could fix ourselves up. I Put the sermon title up there. I call it The Great American Meltdown. We're beginning to see some evidence of that around the edges. A little bit of melting going on. A little bit of turning our backs on God and forgetting God. And we could stand some revival, couldn't we? We could stand some repentance as a nation. I want to talk to you about that day. I'm going to start in Proverbs 14, 34. I changed the sermon title. I changed the whole sermon so what's in your bulletin? You can just pack that up and throw it away. All right? Well, I used the notes page to write on. And uh, yesterday, I'm sitting there. I finished my sermon. I'm ready to go, right? And the Lord said, yeah, you finished your sermon. Now I want you to prepare my sermon. That's frustrating, Brother Ray. Amen? But at least I know I got the right thing. I know I got what God wants us to have here today. I'll be honest with you, I tried every way in the world to just, you know, uh, I was talking of the original title of what, what, something like what makes America great, American America great, and a great nation, but I wanted to keep it so positive, and I'm going to close out on positive, hopeful things today, but 
But there's some things that God just says, we've got to get the truth out there and we need to remember some things today. So Proverbs 14, 34 was where I was going to preach the whole message out of that one verse today. And I said, you know, Lord, they want more than that. They want, you know, I probably wouldn't take me but 15, 20 minutes to preach that and they want more than that. Out of that one verse, I'm not going to have you stand real quick, but it just says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Think about that for just a moment. There's a lot in that verse. There's a lot in that text of Scripture where it, it basically talks about, and this is what I was going to share with you today, the righteousness of that nation, the rewards of that nation, and the revolt of a nation. How that what sin, where it talks about what sin does, and then the reproach of a nation, and America's kind of come under some reproach because of decisions that we're making today. You know, when you look at the economy of America and the the blessings America has known, man, our economy ought to be just rolling, it ought to be smoking, everything ought to be going great, and yet we've got, uh, you know, laws being passed, We're, we're going in debt by trillions of dollars every year, and just digging holes for ourselves and just there's just a lack of wisdom you know in many in our leadership and it's more we're we're improve we're enhancing our encouraging a culture that says don't work and let us just take care of you and we're going to give you some extra money and you just make sure you remember who gave it to you and you vote for us in the next election and and so we've we've run into that kind of a culture today And we need some honesty, and we need some integrity, and we need to get on our knees before God. If you love America, don't just say you love America, but we need to change some things in America. And we need to get on our knees and pray for our nation and its leaders. Today I'm going to spend most of my time in Proverbs, I'm sorry, in Psalm chapter 44. So go ahead and turn over there. I'm going to use that as uh, more of an outline today instead of out of Proverbs here. But in Psalm 44, uh, beginning in verse 1 of that chapter, I'm going to talk to you today about these things that today that we need to re-examine where we are as a nation and grow from that. Just like sometimes I talk to you about things in your life and things that we need to do that can bring us in line to be blessed. Listen, God tells us all the time. He says, look, I'm walking down this path. You walk with me and there are blessings available to you. But if you reject me and you say, I don't need God. I'm going to walk down this path. I want to go my own way. Just understand, you're going to miss a lot of the blessings that I had for you. Same thing's true for nations. Psalm 44, David here is writing about the significance here is uh, uh, the, uh, I know it says this is a, a cor- contemplation of the sons of Korah, but I believe David was involved in this. Some writers say that he was in this psalm, but I want you to see what I'm saying. It's about Israel. It's about the nation of Israel and where the things that, that they had to remind Israel about, and I think we need to be reminded today as America. And so uh, as we celebrate this nation's birthday and all the good things that are going on in this nation, let's take a moment and open in prayer, and then we're going to talk about America and bringing it back today and stopping this meltdown that we're seeing all around us today. Fathers, we pray today, we ask you, Lord, for help. Help for our nation, Lord. God, that there might be a spirit of revival that would flow through this nation, Father. God, that there might be a spirit of brokenness and repentance that would flow through this nation again. Lord, that there might be a a desire for righteousness, Lord, for we know that righteousness exalts a nation, but that sin is a reproach to any nation. And God, today we're we're having trouble, Lord, distinguishing between righteousness and unrighteousness. And Father, today we've decided, many have decided to let their righteousness be determined by their own good works or by their own definition of righteousness instead of your definition of righteousness. Oh God, today, shake us today, Lord. Shake our nation, Father. 
bring us to that place where we fall on our knees and ask for your forgiveness. And then, God, fill us with your Spirit once again. God, that we may not continue to melt down, but that, God, we may return and be blessed. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to point out three things today. That ought to make some of you happy because I only had four in the last sermon I was going to do. So it's just three today. Let's talk about America's previous history. America's previous history. When we think of America, this great nation God has given us here, I think of the first three verses of this chapter 44. Look what it says. We've heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days and days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted afflicted the peoples and cast them out, but they did not gain possessions of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. I think America needs to look back and say we've been favored by God. Would you agree? We've been blessed by God. We've been favored by God. We've been given this land by God. We have been prosperous because of God. When I think of this day, uh, uh, what he's saying to them, Lord, he's, he's talking about the land of Israel, the promised land. He's, he's saying we weren't here, Lord, when you uh, when you drove out the, uh, when you brought the plagues upon Egypt to bring the children of Israel back home, we weren't here when you led them by a, a cloud by day and a, a pillar of fire by night throughout the wilderness. And and Lord, we weren't there when you walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. We didn't see that happen. But God, you, He said, you have favored our nation. He said it didn't happen because of our. By our own sword, but God, you did it. You saved us, Lord. It was your right hand, he said. Your arm, he said, that strengthened this nation. David was saying, Lord, the nation of Israel has become the greatest nation that's ever existed. David taught this, that it was the greatest nation that had ever existed on the face of the earth. Not because of anything they'd done, but they were a great nation because of what God had done. That's my word for America today. We're a great nation because of what God has done. In fact, any connection to Israel, I thought this was unique. Put that guy's picture up there, Daniel, if you would. Anybody know who this guy is? Hey, I'm Solomon. Solomon, actually, that's not a misspelled word. He is the man who is, contri- who is, who is attributed as probably the leader of the, the main reason we won the American Revolution. And he's a Jew from New York. And he basically financed the majority of the American Revolution, the American side. He financed most of it. Would have, would have been multi-millions of dollars in today's currency to fund the troops on the American side. He didn't know that, but I thought it was kind of unique that here's a Jewish man who helped save and create this nation be born because of a man named Ham Solomon. And you know, he died at the age of 44 in 1785, just two years after the signing of all the declaration, I mean, of all the articles and the Constitution, we become a nation, and, and, and basically, which happened in 1783 before everything was finalized. And, and, and you know, it's kind of unique that that here's a man died at the age of 44, broke, didn't have anything, because he gave it all toward the birth of this nation. And that was somebody from Israel. Born in Israel, been chased all over the world, persecuted because of his religion. And he came to America and he helped give birth to a nation. Gave everything he had to give birth to our nation. I say all those things to say this to you today, that we have a lot of people that we owe. He gave everything, and we need to give some things today if we're going to be that nation again that we believe God wanted us to be. 
Think about all the blessings we've had, the technology that we have seen in this nation, the, the, the educational systems that we've had in this nation, the medical uh, advancements of this nation, so many things. we could. I could have gone through and given you quotes today from a lot of our founding fathers about how God, if they didn't keep their eyes on God through all of this, man, this nation wasn't going to make it. And how important it was, how much Scripture was important. Uh, the three branches of government, for example, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Those three branches of government come right out of the Bible. Did you know that? I mean, all that was determined. Most of our laws, most of our initial laws in this nation came right out of the Bible. In fact, they would be, they would be wanting to pass a law sometimes. And you know if they do, and by the way, uh, for people who talk about this separation of church state being meant to be that the state could have no, I mean the church could have no say so. You know what it actually meant? Because when, in, the early, in the early Congress, they used to have churches that met there on Sunday. And they'd come in and preach. And you know what? If they were passing a law, they would have one of the ministers come in and say, you tell us what the Bible says about this law before we vote on it. And he would preach a sermon on that law and whether God would be in favor of it or against it. Oh, that we had that today. Our infamous governor in this state just vetoed uh, Friday afternoon after he thought all the media was closed down. He, he, uh, he, he vetoed our bill that basically says you can going to stop destroying our little children's lives who we had gone down and spoke and passed a bill about uh, saying that when, you know the little children want to be transgendered and, they're, and you know, change them and go in and, and I don't even want to describe all the things that they do to cut them up and make them and, and try to turn boys into girls and girls into boys and, and at little ages and if, no matter what the parents think if some teacher got to them they'd try to, they'd try to say well you can do it anyway whether your parents want it or not we passed a bill passed by over 75% of the legislature and the governor said, I'm going to kill that. I want them to be able to damage these children as much as they possibly can. And I went down and spoke about the bill about, about teachers. Hey, teacher, if you teach math or you teach English or you teach science, guess what? Teach math and English and science. Don't teach us about your lifestyle. Don't teach us about what you think is right. And, uh, and, and they, he hasn't vetoed that one yet. We're going to give him another day or two, but he's probably going, he said he's going to veto it too. He wants teachers to be able to warp you as much as they possibly can if they get a chance. And so we, we understand that today. Those are the kind of things that are, that when I say we're melting down around the edges, those things are meltdowns. Would you agree? They're definitely not God. Definitely not something God's a part of. And I say all that to say this, friends, we have had so many blessings. I think about the victory in the Revolutionary War. My goodness, we should have never won the Revolutionary War. The, the English armed military was the greatest military in the world. And we were able to, to defeat them with God's help. In fact, I've got a couple of American Revolution veterans here today. I want to have Larry and Eddie stand. I mean, they fought in the... Amer didn't y'all fight in the American Revolution? I, I thought y'all did. I knew it was one of them wars way back there. I knew it was one of those wars. I just wasn't sure which one. <laughs> and, and so, well, wait, maybe I got that confused. I'm not sure. But, but America's been blessed with a lot of wonderful, wonderful things, haven't we? All the different wars, the victories that we've known from the French War to the World War I, World War II... And then uh, America has known some, some great, great moments, and we have so much to be thankful for. Look at verses 4 through 7 with me uh, right quick after that. Four through seven. You're my king, O God, the psalmist prayed here. Command victories for Jacob. Though you, though, through you we will push down our enemies. Through your name we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in the bow and I, or the sword to save me, for, for you are going to save us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. And in God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Boy, isn't that a good word right there? We're not going to trust in our strength. Listen, America's got a great military and great strength in the military, but I'm here to tell you something. If we trust in our own strength instead of God, we can be defeated. 
I mean, us to go back and look at the Korean War and the Vietnam War didn't exactly turn out like we wanted them to, did they? We didn't necessarily lose, but we didn't necessarily win either. Brought a little shame on us, didn't us? Because maybe we just thought we could do it halfway. But my point being, God has got to be a part. We've got to get on our knees and our faces before God if we're going to see great things happen in this nation. So verse 8 says there, We boast all day long and praise your name, O God, forever. We've stopped doing that. We've stopped celebrating God. And so once when we had those godly leaders who said, who said, we can't make it without God, we had those godly leaders who said, we better stay on our knees and trust Him because it's His arm that's going to take us through these victories. Well, friends, I believe with all of my heart that's what needs to happen. I believe with all of my heart the force of America's great history. Man, we have, we've been blessed because God has blessed us. And friends, we live in a day and a time today when we have second-guessed and thought that we knew better than God. In fact, today, you go, to go, go into most law schools today, and they'll actually, they have a book that's entitled The Godless, Godless America or The Godless Founding of America. I forget what it was. They say God had nothing to do with America's founding. They literally teach that in law schools today. I shouldn't be surprised. It's a law school. But they don't want to think that God has anything to do with America's greatness. So let's make sure we understand today, we're not here to worship America. We're here to worship the God who gave us this nation. To celebrate Him. What a shame it is. The the next thing I want you to see is America's present helplessness. America's present helplessness that... And when Israel, they became the the nation that under David was the greatest nation on the world. And David at least felt like that's what they wrote about. It was the greatest nation. And yet they became a helpless nation when they turned their eyes off of God. Verses 9 through 14 talks about their shame. He says, but you have. Now here's what's happened. Verse 9, but you have cast us off and put us to shame, the psalmist said. You do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy. And those who hate us have taken spoils for themselves. They've given us up like sheep intended for food. You want to talk about some spoils? Let's talk about the spoils that we left in Afghanistan. Let's talk about the the whole... I mean, we left more in Afghanistan than most nations' military even consists of. We've been put to shame by some of these foolish leaders we have in D.C. today. And and we are doing exactly what the psalmist said. You've given us up like sheep intended for food and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing. You're, You're not enriched by selling them. You make a reproach. Make us a reproach to our neighbors. A scorn, a derision to those all around us. Why do you think China's getting so strong today? Why do you think Russia was silly enough to move into Ukraine And I love the Ukrainian people. Why do you think that happened? Because we've become a reproach and a scorn and nations laugh at us because of the silly leadership we have today as a nation. And you can say, preacher, preacher, just tell us that we're all doing great. The fact is, we got silly people leading our nation today. And that's a fact that we need to face. And we need to get rid of this mess. Amen? We need to be realizing that God is the only hope that we have. And we need to get our eyes. Because He's saying here we've brought shame and reproach and scorn. And other nations look at us and like I, verse, verse, verse 14 says, You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. Can't you see some of these leaders like China's leader? And Putin over in Russia just shaking our hand and saying, what in the world were they thinking? This dude, this dude running this country, this president, got to have somebody take him to the bathroom every day. <laughs> and yet he's making world decisions. 
And y'all can send him a copy of this sermon if you want to. Because I ain't worried about it. I was the first person in the state of Louisiana. I attended a conference uh, some years ago, and we were challenged to take on the IRS. The IRS says, says, you preachers can't talk about politics in your church. I said, well, you out of your mind. <laughs> Alliance Defending Freedom brought me up to a conference in Chicago, and, and uh, I'm going to another one in August in, at Liberty University in Virginia, a uh, new group that's asked me to come up there, Tim Lee, who we just had in Revival. He is chairman of the board of Liberty University, and, and we're going up there and look at more things to do to save our nation. To save our nation. Now, friends, don't think the main reason we're going to save our nation is not by a bigger military, necessarily, even, though we do, even though we can't even fill out our roles now. But we're going to save our nation by getting on our knees. We're going to learn to fight on our knees. Because this is a spiritual warfare that we're fighting. It's a spiritual battle. You're not going to win it by carrying a pistol or, you know, and we love our Second Amendment. Yeah, but we're not going to win it. It's a spiritual battle. And we've got to understand that we've got to win it. We've got to turn our hearts back to God. Verses 15 to 22 says there's a... Let's look at the sufferings of this next verse, if you would. Look there. In 15 to 22, he says... Uh, uh, let me read that. My dishonor is continually before me. The shame of my face has covered me, the psalmist is writing. Because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger, all this has come upon us. We have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Ours have. But you have severely broken us in places in the place of jackals, covered us with the shadow of death. My friends, if we had, he says, if we had forgotten the name of our God, if we'd forgotten the name of God, stretched out our hands to foreign gods, would not God search us out this out? He knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sakes we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. What a, what a, a word there. You know, I'm reminded of, of Jericho. I'm reminded that nations that turned their back on God. You remember they went into Jericho, the unbeatable city, and they went in there and, and Israel, following God, went in there and took Jericho. Didn't even have to basically, like the old saying, fire a shot. They marched around it and prayed for seven days and blew the trumpets. The walls came down. They won that battle through trusting God, praising God. But then they go to a little bitty town called Ai right after that. You remember that story in Ai? And they went to Ai, a little bitty town. They just sent a few soldiers out there to beat up on Ai. And got, got, guess what? They sent them home with their tail tucked. Said, no, 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 no. Why? Because they disobeyed God. They disobeyed God and God, just, God took them down. It's kind of what's happening in our world today. If we're not careful, we, we lose our focus on God. And, and, and let, me, let me share with you another story. Turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 9. Back over there, right before you get to Nehemiah and all those other, some of those other verses. Ezra, chapter 9, I want you to see that. I want you to see a prayer and see if this sounds familiar. Beginning in verse 5. Here's Ezra, this great man of God in the Old Testament. He said, At the evening sacrifice I arose from my fasting. I have torn my garment and my robe. And I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our, talking about Israel, our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Hey, folks, America needs to pray like that. Because right now, our iniquities are coming up before God. We call good evil and evil good. We say if it feels good, if I like it, do it. 
He says, since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty, and for our iniquities, we, have, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, to humiliation, as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God. Aren't you glad that we're still under the grace of God? I'm going to tell you, the only reason we're still going today is the grace of God. Of God. Are you with me? God's grace is still shared, is still poured out upon us. And he goes on and says, For a little while grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. And give us a peg in this holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage. But He extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of God, to rebuild its ruins, to give us a wall of Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we've forsaken your commandments. <laughs> we're so ashamed of the Ten Commandments today, we don't want to put it on the walls of our schools. Wouldn't it be terrible if our kids started believing things like thou shalt not lie? That'd be terrible. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, we don't need to be pushing kids in that direction of religion, do we? And now, our God, oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants and the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the people of the lands and their abominations, which have filled it from one end to the other with impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters and wives and sons and daughters to these. You know what he's basically saying there? Don't give your families over to this world. Hey, friends, this world wants to eat your children alive. This world wants to destroy your family. I'm here to tell you one of the greatest battles today is for our homes. For our homes to be what God intended them to be. I'm here to tell you they ought to, one thing it ought to be a, a mark of us today is that we as people of God, our families, are marked by the protection of the hand of God. I'm here to tell you the devil's having a heyday. He's destroying and dividing as quickly as he can. And let me give you the last thing in closing. Don't forget that verse, Proverbs 14, 34. Underline that in your Bible. For righteousness exalts a nation. And righteousness is not what you think is right. It's not what you think is good. I hear profanities run rampant today. I hear, I hear kickback from some of the the young people, you say, don't talk like that. So, well, everybody talks like that. Busting out all the cuss words and using the F-bombs and the GDs like, well, everybody does that. Well, no, everybody don't do that. Not the godly. Hello? The godly don't do it. Which camp are we in? And yet we look at our world today and we think, well, I'll be okay. I'm here to tell you the devil is eating us alive and he's turned up the heat and we're beginning to melt down around the edges. Now, I could get up here and preach you a sermon that everything's going to be great. And I will. I'm just going to change my tune right now. How about that? Put number three on the screen, Daniel. America's powerful hope. 
Two things. We must return to God. Look at verse 23, and we'll conclude with verse, two verses, verse 23 and verse 25. I'm going to read 23 through 26 just to get the context of all that. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore didst thou thy face, and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, and our belly cleaved unto the earth. Arise for our help, and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. Awake, awake. Boy, we look at our world today and there's so many that are asleep on God. They've given in to the world. And we think God, and we've pushed God away and we've said, God, I don't need you. And God's saying, well, I'm still here. I'm available. But you've got to turn around. That word for repent there, that word for return, I, I should say, is a word means that we've got to change our direction and go in the direction of God. And then the next word is the word repent. The next slide, Daniel, if you would put that up there from verse 25. How important it is, for our soul is bowed down to the dust, our body clings to the ground. It's a picture there of a person who has just bowed before God and said, God, I'm not out looking for the party I'm not out looking to get high. I'm not out looking to get drunk. I'm not out running around chasing flesh. God, I am bowed as low as I can get. I'm laying in the dirt saying, God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can get nothing. I just need you. And until America gets back to there, we will not be blessed. We're going to get worse and worse and worse as long as we seek to please ourselves. Well, preacher, don't you think God just wants us to have fun? Don't you think God just wants us to feel good? Acts 17.30 says, And in times of this ignorance, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now, He commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And that word repent means a new direction. That word repent here means to think differently. I can't. I can't preach to everybody in New York. I can't preach to the folks out in California. I I can't preach in everywhere. But God has placed me to be a shepherd in this place. And I'm going to do everything I can to to impact and affect West Washtenaw Parish. And say the rest of the world may go crazy. But we're going to lay here in the dirt till God does something. That's why next month, next Sunday, we got a guy coming who's going to teach you how to witness to people. He's going to teach you. We're going to be, all next Sunday is going to be focused upon a, a, a study book, a book that he brought. It, it, it starts out with a simple question. Can I ask you a question? And how to get into the story. How to get into talking to somebody about Jesus. Oh, do you know Him this morning? You see, next Sunday He's going to be here. And then i got a guy coming in in August, this uh, Steve Hale, who's going to talk to us about... It's a men's conference Friday night and Saturday. He's going to talk to us about lust. He's going to talk to us about having eyes that please God. Well, preacher, I don't even want to go there. (laughs) But we're going to get together as men and we're going to talk about how to be godly men. 
And we're going to make an impact on West Washtenaw Parish. And we're going to start talking to our friends about Jesus. Now, friends, I want to say something to you. Salvation is more, salvation is more than just knowing that Jesus existed in the past. There's more to being saved than just knowing that Jesus is real in history. It's more than knowing that He died on the cross. I mean, I look at that old, that old legion, all them demons in there, and, and, and they said, man, we, just send us into the pigs. We'd rather be in pigs. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking about that. I mean, when those demons recognized Jesus when He came on the scene, they said, we know who you are. You might be one of them pig demons, but that don't mean you're saved. You might know who Jesus is. The question is, are we willing to follow Him? Because repentance says, you see, at repentance we recognize who He is, and we're broken and sorry because of our sinfulness. And repentance says, I've been going my way, I see Jesus, now I'm going to turn and go Jesus' way. I told a little girl the other day, uh, Monday night, we had a couple of people saved. It did outreach time Monday night. And one of them was a young lady, and I was dropping her and a young man off, and she prayed to receive Christ right there in the car. But I told her, I said, young lady, what you need to understand is like this. It's like right now, you're living your life. You're driving the car. You want Jesus in the back seat somewhere. You just want to have Him back there in case you need Him. When you get saved, it means you get in the back seat and He gets in the front seat. And He's under the wheel. And you go where He want to go. That's what it means to make Him the Lord and Savior of your life. So I want to ask you this morning, have you ever come to that place? The hope for America begins right here at 824 Highway 3033 in West Monroe, Louisiana. The hope to save America is we've got to make a difference in West Washtenaw Parish, first of all. We've got to decide when we walk in these doors, we're not going to be hypocrites. We're not going to say God wants one thing, but I want something else. We've got to decide that we are willing to follow Christ, not just know who He is. I'm glad you recognize Him, but the Bible says unless we repent, we'll all likewise perish. Have you come to a place and a time in your life when you have bowed down and said to Jesus, listen to me now, listen, and I'm closing. But wait, you can come on to the piano. Get ready, and the keyboard. Get us ready, you musicians. Here's what you're saying. God, I'm a sinner. And God, I know you're the Savior. And you never sin. And God, I've been doing things my way. But God, today I bow before you and I make you the Lord of my life. I don't have anything to offer but a broken heart. I'm ashamed of the sin in my life. But God, if you'll give me grace, I'll turn. And follow you. Forgive my sins. Save me, oh God. I place all my faith in you, Lord. Cleanse me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I'm going to seek to honor you. Now friends, it's that attitude that God honors. Not, not the attitude that says, well, go ahead and dunk me on that water because I want to go to heaven. You can get dunked under that water till your skin wrinkles up like a prune and not go to heaven. But you and I have to get to that place where we're willing to say, and can I just confess something to you? I blow it a lot. I'm not perfect. 
And if you pray that prayer, you're not going to be perfect either. But I'll tell you, the desire of your heart will be to be a God-honoring young man, young woman. You will want to honor God. If you've never done that, if you've never done that, you say, Pastor, I, I've never done that. I, I, I want to know. And you may be sitting here saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sure. I think maybe I'm okay. I, I might be saved. Uh, well, you know, I've always believed there was a God. Well, that's, that's nice, but that's not, the, that's not the decision. Have you surrendered to Him? You say, I don't know what i got to do, Pastor. Well, let me tell you, let me just start you off the simplest way I know how. I'm going to stand right here. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father in heaven. There's a lot of ways you can get saved. I know a lot of places. You, but, but one of the easiest ways, and the closest one to you right now, is to get up out of that pew in just a moment when we sing, walk down this aisle, take me by the hand, and say, I, three words, I want Jesus. And I'll lead you through that process. Brother Hugh, come out from back there. We, we fish and get a lot of folks get saved. And I can't handle it all by myself. I want you to wait right here. Y'all can sing without him beating and banging, right? Okay. I need, I need somebody else to come up. Brother Ray, come stand over here. I got folks. Well, I probably need to get Brother Ray. Come on up here, Brother Ray. Because they plan on joining today anyway, so I'll just let him and Miss... Miss uh... Can you fill out, can you counsel yourself yeah. to join the church? Okay. <laughs> Let's stand. Let's stand. If you had not been saved, friend, don't leave here today without saying, I want Jesus. Don't leave here today without changing direction. You say you love America, it begins with you. Us being what God wants us to be. Come on, let God have His way. While we sing this song, you come on right now. God have your way is our desire right now. In Jesus' name. Without Him I could do nothing. sing this next verse. You come on. The altar's open if you want to pray. You want to move your membership here from another church? You feel free to do that. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do it right now. Don't wait. Last verse if no one moves. Court. Oh,
Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Please don't turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. bow with me as we concluding up here just bow with me our God and our Father may no one leave here today uncertain of their salvation may no one leave here today Lord uncommitted to your will to your righteousness for their life may we leave here today Lord with a new zeal a new passion, a new hunger for spiritual things. May we have all rededicated ourselves today to the cause of loving America and seeking to save America by putting you first ahead of everything else. Lord, today we ask you to glorify yourself in this church, in this community, God, help us to make a difference. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to stay close to that? Okay. Just remain standing. Just remain. Miss Sue, you come up here too. Come up here. Okay. Y'all, this is Miss Sue Calhoun. She come today saying, Brother Mike, I need to be saved. And she prayed with me and asked Christ to come into your heart. Is that right? Amen. And so when the service is over, you come by and extend a right hand of fellowship to her. And Ray and Charlotte Mears, y'all know, they've been here before. Uh, Brother Ray has been a mentor of mine most of my life. He taught me missions and just been a blessing uh, to me for a number of years since back in the... I guess it was around 1990, 91, somewhere in that neighborhood that we became friends. Another pastor friend introduced us, and, and uh, Brother Ray and I have worked together and done mission work around the world, and so we, I appreciate them coming back to be a part of us here at Washita. Thank you all for being here today. Hey, at 5 o'clock today, we're going to come up and just enjoy each other's fellowship. We got hamburgers and hot dogs and... In fact, I don't think we need to bring anything. Is that right? Nobody needs to bring anything? Who said that? All right. Everything's going to be prepared. You got all hamburgers and hot dogs and bring board games. If you got a board game you like, we got a big water slide set up out there for the kids. Uh, there's a lot of things to be doing, but you can play board games inside. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be in the air condition. I'm going to tell you that right now. So whoever wants to be lifeguard, you can go out there and be lifeguard at the water slide, but I'm not going to be one of them. All right? It's so good to see all of you here today in the house of the Lord. Eddie, come on up and pray for us. Close us out in prayer. And y'all come by and just tell these lovely folks that you love them. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. and We just we heard a message this morning that the whole world needs to hear. Father, our nation is in turmoil. And I thank Brother Mike for the message he gave us that our nation was founded 
under your supervision, under the, your roof. Father, we just pray for our nation. Sanctify our leadership. Father, just be with us as we struggle through these days that we know that we're in turmoil. Father, we especially want to thank, thank you for the nations you give us. Father, we ask you to continue to bless our church, to bless our nation. And most of all, Father, we want to thank you for being the one responsible for all of this. Father, we love you and need you. And all these things I ask in your precious holy name. Amen.